This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me up to New York. Love, love New York, love Ithaca. Um, before we get started, I know we've got some, at least one retailer, right? Um, how many growers are in the audience? Okay, landscapers? Couple, educators, master gardeners? Wow, okay, really good, okay. Well, I'm very pleased to talk to you about pollinators because it's an extremely important topic. Um, and we can all, we can definitely all help. Listening to Carol was very helpful um, to see, you know, where is our gardening public going and who do we need to reach out to? Just coming um, about three weeks ago from the International Pollinator Conference at Penn State, I can tell you that the pollinator crisis is very real and it's something that we have to address worldwide. I think the good news is that all of us here working in the screen industry can be part of the solution. And again, listening to Carol, I was thinking about the connection with kids. I mean, what's a more wonderful connection than plants, butterflies, bees? You know, things that move, because kids love this kind of thing. And food gardening, um, it, it's a perfect match. So what I want to do, I'm going to kind of take you through a quick introduction for those of you who might not be terribly familiar with pollinators. Uh, we're going to talk about who they are. We're going to talk about the stressors on them. And then the important part, um, what can we do to help them with our floral resources? OK. So most of you guys know this. Why are pollinators important? Well, we like to eat. We like to eat watermelon. We like to eat squash. We like to eat blueberries and apples. And these are all things that are insect pollinated. So without these, our diets become very bland. Um, we also have an economic value going on here. Uh, without pollinators, we have definitely have some economic problems. And then there's the ecosystem. Without pollination of plants, we have no seeds, we have no berries, which means we have no food web. And everything really does collapse. Um, which is why we call pollinators keystone species. We cannot pull these guys out and still have all of us survive. Okay. So I think when you're gardening for pollinators and you're thinking about plants for them, it's important to know who our pollinators are. Because um, it's not just honeybees, it's a very, very wide range of diversity. And each of these guys use something just a little bit different. Um, so flies, I know flies aren't a big sell to the public, but some of them are actually quite beautiful. The surfed fly over here on the left, some kind, sometimes also called hoverfly, very frequent flower visitors, and they do their share of pollination. And as a bonus, their larvae are wonderful aphid eaters. So we've got beneficial insects going on here too. This tachnid fly, not quite as pretty over on the left, um, or excuse me, on your right, um, this tachnid fly is actually very important because it's a parasitoid of the brown marmorated stink bug, lays its eggs on them. So these pollinators that are visiting these plants have more benefit than just moving pollen and nectar, or moving pollen. Beetles, very frequent flower visitors. I can't tell you how many people bring these into the office after they've killed them because they've said they're on my flowers and must be doing something bad. Um, but this soldier beetle, is actually another beneficial and you know it actually does eat some aphids um, and as a flower visitor it's moving some pollen. Butterflies and moths, easy sell. Maybe poster child for pollinators. Not as efficient because their legs hold them above the flower so they're not moving around as much pollen but they're absolutely beautiful. They have they definitely have another role in the environment, and that's their caterpillars feeding birds, which is, is supporting the whole food web. Um, but when we're talking to people about pollinators, sometimes this is the way to get them into pollinator gardening, because who doesn't love butterflies? And of course, birds. Uh, another very beloved pollinator. I, I would think that cardinal flower and this bee bomb, Monarda, would be very, very, very easy to sell. Uh, we find that in our, in our Master Gardener plant sales um, because people want to support these beautiful birds. 
And then we get into the Hymenoptera, the wasps and the bees. And yes, if you have pollinator-friendly plants, you are going to have a lot of wasps. Most of them are solitary. Um, they're not the yellow jacket type social wasp. They're solitary. The, the female's doing all of her work. She's far too busy to even, even think about stinging. A lot of these are ground nesters. This is actually uh, one we've been doing some work on at our pollinator plot. This is by Surtees. Um, she is a ground nester, and during her lifetime, which is very short, she can kill 40 or kill and take back to the nest 40 brown marmorated stink bugs. So, you know, very, they're flower visitors, but they're also um, performing other functions for us. And then there's the bees. These are our main pollinators, there's no doubt about that. All the bees are um, very effective at pollination because they are collecting pollen. These other visitors are strictly getting nectar and kind of accidentally moving things with them. These guys have to collect pollen to take back to the nest to feed their larvae, to feed the young. Uh, and they're very well adapted for it with their bodies and pollen collectors. Everybody's familiar with honeybees? But not everybody knows that honeybees are actually a farmed bee. They're not considered wild. They were brought over from Europe with the Jamestown settlers, and it's been an economic uh, farm product ever since. What folks aren't too familiar with is the native bees, and we have a lot of them. Before these honeybees were brought over, pollination was happening here. We had a great ecosystem going, and there are over 20,000 species worldwide. Right here in the Mid-Atlantic region, we figured in Pennsylvania we have about 450. We're discovering new species every day because until we had the problem with pollinators, nobody was doing a whole lot of studying. And so now, with everything being geared up, we are learning a lot. And these species are very, very varied. Um, there's all kinds of bees out there. Bumblebees most people are familiar with. They are a social bee. The queen actually has workers in a small colony in the ground, maybe 250 of them. Um, and then these other bees are solitary. Again, the queen is doing all of her own work. She might only be laying 10, 12 eggs. She might be laying them in the ground, uh, in hollow, hollow stems. She might be using dead wood. So all of these nesting sites become extremely important. And these bees vary from the pretty large carpenter bee down to the tiny little sweat bee that is really difficult to identify when they're on the flowers. But there are a lot of them out there. We have bees that are specialists, and this is important when we're thinking about what we're planting. Um, the squash bee on, the, on your left over here actually nests underneath squash plants. And you don't need honeybees if you're growing squash because You've, if you plant it, they will come. If your farming practices are not disturbing their nests, they will be there for you. The males fall asleep in the flowers. They're very, very sweet. Um, and they take care of your, your crop for you. It's a native bee. Um, the mining bee on the right, I put in here because there is a particular mining bee that is a specialist on goldenrod that the way it collects pollen and its collectors only fit one size of pollen grain, and that's from goldenrod or aster. And so without goldenrod or aster, those bees are gone. Uh, so these specialist bees are not as common, but they have a very important niche, and we need to keep the diversity, so they're very important. Uh, other bees have a really wide floral range. Can, bumblebees are this way. This wonderful little leaf cutter bee can go from one species to another um, and, and actually visit many, many different families of flowers. And we need, we need both of these groups. Okay. The bad news is pollinators are declining. Um, and it's a rather steep decline. It's happening quickly. We have about 34 animals identified as pollinators that are endangered or threatened. And then look at the number of flowering species that are also endangered or threatened. 
And the, the relationship between the flowers and their pollinators is very tight. So sometimes if you lose a floral, re a floral resource, you're going to lose a pollinator and, and vice versa. Um, so this is a concerning issue. This last winter, um, honeybees declined again. These are our farmed bees. They lost 45%. 15% um, loss is what they normally would expect. And this has been going on now for quite a few years, ever since we've heard about the colony collapse disorder. Our wild bees are also in trouble. We might never have known this if colony collapse hadn't happened with the honeybees. We may never have actually started to study these other bees. But we've got at least five species of our North American bumblebees um, that are, are shrinking in range. And part of this is due to climate change. There's a lot of other reasons as well. 13 out of 46 species of our bumblebees are now threatened or near threatened. This is not good news because the bumblebee globally is our second most important pollinator of crops, second only to that, that farmed honeybee that's being taken around. And then butterflies, wow, um, 141 different species at risk. Of course, the latest one that everybody knows about is, is the monarch, right? Okay. So, what in the world is going on with our pollinators? What is stressing them out so much? Well, there is no one smoking gun to this. It's hard to do research on these wonderful, um, you know, wonderful creatures because there's so many factors coming in. We know that habitat nutrition is one, pesticide exposure, We've got diseases, viruses, uh, fun funguses out there, um, pests, genetics. We know that climate change is, is playing a role. And when these all come together, it's somewhat of a recipe for disaster. I'm going to talk about these two, uh, the pesticides and the nutrition, because these are things we can do something about. The rest of this we have to kind of leave to the researchers. And habitat loss is huge, both of nesting habitat. You know, they can't nest in mulch. They can't nest um, in thick turf. So our gardening practices are kind of against them. And we've fragmented our landscape so much that some of these insects can't fly across some of the, um, the more urban areas that we've created. And a noted ecologist down in Arizona has determined over 95% of the land in the lower 48 states is either in agriculture or development. That doesn't leave a whole lot for our pollinator friends. And our farming practices in the Midwest have changed drastically, and we know this is, this is a definite problem for pollinators. Uh, these vast fields of monocultures, you know, hedgerows, you know, pollinator strips, you know, uh, there's just nothing there for the pollinators. Here in the Northeast, we're a little better off um, because our farms are smaller. We still do have hedgerows. We've got you know, forest lands in between. And so we're definitely, we're definitely better here than in the Midwest. Our suburban areas are the other part of this. Um, as natural fields and forests are plowed down or taken down for our development for homes and businesses, what we put back in our yards does not begin to, um, to satisfy the needs of the pollinators. Our, our turf, our, our plants, which we're importing mostly from other countries, um, just not a lot there. And even our campuses, as beautiful as, as our own Penn State campus is, when I walk around, I see a lot of places where you know, we, could, we could do better and we could be putting in more floral resources. We could be filling this up with flowers. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We fill everything with flowers. A lot of the natural lands that are left um, have been overrun with invasives, and I know you have a, a talk on that a little bit later. This is a, a state, state forest in Pennsylvania, which is being overrun by Japanese stiltgrass and Japanese barberry that has escaped from our yards. Um, and once you get that kind of monoculture in the forest, crowding out a lot of the, the wildflowers, our pollinators have trouble. 
Pesticides are a tough issue, and uh, I'm not an expert on pesticides, so I'll kind of relay to you what our Center for Pollinator Research has found so far. Um, we know that pesticides are part of this whole problem. We also know that whatever we put down, pollinators pick up. And in a study um, back around 2007 we, of pollen samples, we found out that there were 121 different pesticides identified in wax and pollen samples from honeybees. So if we, if we put it out, they're picking it up. Okay. So what are those? Um, there's a lot. There were very few samples that didn't have anything in them. And of the 121 different ones, here is a list of some of the categories. You, you see some very familiar pesticides there. You said very few samples, you mean like, like 1%? So are you looking at? That's a good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure what percentage, but um, we can find that out. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. She asked what percentage of the samples did not have any detection. So it says very few, but I don't have that actual percentage. Okay. Uh, we have systemics out there that are, are getting into pollen, into nectar, and they're getting them, the pollinators are getting them that way. And per pollen sample, each one had an average of six different pesticides. Um, so it's, it's really, it was very eye-opening for our researchers um, to see this. I'm sorry, what, what is your sample size? Oh, of the, of the entire, you, I don't know how many samples they looked at. Again, the Center for Pollinator Research, we can get that from them. How, how many samples they sampled? Yeah, no, 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 no
um, but they have found sublethal effects from the neonics and impaired foraging behavior, um, you know, the decreased reproduction. And so the, the recommendation that is coming out is don't use neonics prophylactically. And if you're growing a lot of the plants that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes, there's no need to be using anything in them because these plants are tough. And um, so wherever you can, especially with pollinator plants, try to stay away from, from any kind of systemic. Um, they also discovered that fungicides play a role here, which really complicates things, especially for the orchard folks. Um, and the fungicides can actually synergize with some of the insecticides, particularly the three listed here, and become stronger. We also don't know what the inert ingredients of the pesticides do, and there are some researchers looking at that. What is in those inert ingredients? We need to find that out, and how can they affect pollinators? So with the pesticides, it's complicated. It's very complicated. Um, Herbicides play a role, too, in that by spraying our roadsides or median strips, you know, we're killing off a lot of our floral resources, reducing habitat. In our lawns, um, violets are a good early season source of nectar for bees, host plant for the fritillary butterfly. Clover, which used to be a mainstay in our lawns back at, you know, my grandfather always seeded clover into his lawn, um, but today, in this generation, clover is a weed. Uh, we've kind of made it that way. But clover is a wonderful source for, for bees. Um, you know, so the herbicides can, can do some damage to us too. So just in general, these are some of the recommendations that the center came out with for protecting pollinators um, from pesticides. You know, know, know what you're using, know how toxic it is. Sometimes, sometimes that's not so easy because what's toxic to a honeybee might not be toxic to a bumblebee, vice versa. Um, it's, it's complicated. Um, but never use pesticides on blooming crops. And then pre-bloom, don't use the systemics because some of these can linger in the plant for a long time. So that's bad news but there's good news. And at this international conference this last, uh, this last month, the one theme that came through of so many of the papers was that even in the presence of diseases and in the presence of pesticides, if these pollinators were well fed, if they had good nutrition, they could fight off some of this, some of these effects. And it's no different from us. You know, if we're run down, we don't have a good diet, we don't have a, a diverse diet, yeah, we're, we, we can easily get, pick, pick up a cold, pick up a flu, uh, pick up anything. And they're no different. And so we can really make a difference, even in the face of the other things they're facing, by giving them a diverse diet, by giving them what they really need um, the best possible nectar, the best possible pollen, we can dilute some of these, these compounds um, and dilute the effects of some of the diseases. So to me, I kind of came away from, the, from that conference feeling like, yes, what we do and how the green industry responds to this really can make a huge difference. The other good news is the gardeners that I talked to are aware. They you know they're kind of tied into this and those new gardeners that Carol was talking about, they want their kids they want their kids to be tied in. They know that we have some environmental problems going on here and they're anxious for the kids to learn. And what a wonderful learning opportunity that could be paired with you know with our, our garden centers. Because um, these guys are hungry and Providing food is also a very feel-good thing for all of us. It can also be lucrative. Um, Michigan State just did a study of, on, this was actually on the labeling of plants treated with pesticides. 
And the study found that plants that were labeled bee-friendly, as being grown in a bee-friendly way, were much preferred by the consumers. So people are responding to this. They want to help. They also found out that people are willing to pay a little more for a plant that was grown in a bee-friendly way, in fact, up to a dollar more. So there's an opportunity there as well. And I'm, I'm assuming, because of how consumers are reacting, that they would react the same way to not just plants that were grown in a pollinator-friendly way, but growing plants that are truly, really nutritious and good for pollinators. Um, I think the labeling of these plants would, would definitely be helpful, and, and there's all kinds of things you could do in a garden center to, you know, to make that attractive. Um, but the big question is, what are the best pollinator plants? And we are still trying to answer that question. Um, we're getting closer. We know that some of our modern hybrids that are being developed, especially in the annual world, and are being developed for color or size or um, you know, just appeal, may or may not have pollen or nectar. Um, sometimes the nectaries are bred out of the plant, so the pollen is bred out of it. Sometimes the plant can become so complicated in structure that the pollinator has no idea how to get to the pollen that's there. Um, if you look at our, at our native plants, they are, they have been, they've been co-evolved to actually attract pollinators. I mean, some have, I'll show you some here, some have guidelines. I mean, some are just saying, hey guys, your pollinators may not be too smart here. This is where you come. And a plant like this, it's a little confusing. Um, so down at our Penn State Research Station, um, near where I live in Landisville, where we have our flower trials, the Center for Pollinator Research has set up a row for pollinator insect study. And they've taken some of the most common set good sellers at garden centers, and the uh, researchers from the center are coming down and evaluating them for poll pollinator visitation, which I'm really glad they're doing this, because we need to know and it's, it's not, nothing wrong with having a plant in your garden that doesn't attract pollinators, but we also need to be including plants that do attract pollinators. We need to know what they are. Um, we do know from our studies that most native perennials are good pollinator plants. Yeah, Karen. Checking question. Are you doing uh, like existing varieties that are at garden centers in this past? That's kind of what they chose. Um, you know, when availability was part of, was part of the issue, too, when, when they did that. But, um, and as they go forward, they're going to target, you know, specific plants a little bit more and, and try to see what, what are the best sellers out there, what are people buying, and how can we label these things. Okay. Uh, most native perennial plants we know are good for pollinators because they co-evolve together. Without their pollinators, these plants wouldn't have made it through. But when we change them and we, we create cultivars from them, what happens? On the left is a straight species of, of echinacea, our coneflower, um, and boy, you know, pollinator heaven. On the right is another one in our trials, and I haven't spent much time over there looking, but the few times that I've been over, I haven't seen any pollinators on that guy. And it's because we've, we've changed it is, is anything still there? These are things we need to find out. Mount Cuba is doing some great studies down at the University of, um, with, with the University of Delaware. And uh, Dr. Delaney and one of her grad students, Owen Cass, have been looking at Monardas and Coreopsis and trying to determine which ones of these are attracting pollinators. They're even looking at the nectar. They're analyzing the nectar. You know, what does it have? Does it have the proteins and the lipids? Does it have what pollinators really need? And they're looking at a lot of cultivars. So if you ever get down there, um, it's a really neat place to visit. And they do have some reports out. They were also just looking at the plants themselves. You know, 
which ones are the most attractive, which ones hold up the best. So this pollinator study is now a little addition to all of this. And these reports are online. Uh, this is their Coreopsis report. Um, Owen should be putting his Minarda um, report out pretty soon. Okay. And then lastly, um, we did a, a trial study at our research station, 2012 to 2014, where we looked at 84 different species of native plants and their cultivars. And these were replicated in five by five plots three times. Um, and we had master gardeners helping us with this as well as, as well as our researchers. So before I go into the results of that study, which is what your handout is all about, um, for those of you that are landscapers, just wanted to mention a few things um, about how we can make some changes in our landscaping to help out the pollinators. Here are three properties, very different in size. The one on the top is about 35 acres, um, got meadow, um, it's all been landscaped in native plants, done pro professionally done, and even the pool area. I mean, this is a wonderful floral resource for pollinators. But down on the bottom left is a small garden in the city of York, postage stamp size. But look what she's done. Um, she has put a lot of wonderful floral resources in there, um, still has a little bit of lawn, but she's beauty year round, or, well, three seasons. Um, and then on the right, this is a nursing home, also in York County, where they have taken grass and they've turned it into a therapeutic place for their, um, their residents, a place of beauty, a place alive with pollinators that the residents are lining up to get into this nursing home because they want to be able to look out on this, this wonderful courtyard. So size doesn't matter. Every space that we have can be utilized. But what all three of these places had in, have in common is they have put plants closer together. We have plants touching each other, uh, reduced use of mulch and landscape fabric because the uh, nesting, they can't nest with landscape fabric. Um, and so by, by packing in our plants, letting them touch, letting them be a little bit more natural, um, weed-free. There's no space there for weeds to grow. Um, so that's a really big help as well. There's still maintenance, obviously, but it's a different, different kind of maintenance. So think about that. In really large areas, landscape plugs can be very helpful. Yeah. A negative. A um, couple things. One is if, if you're pl spacing plants, you know, two, three feet apart, but have a need for mulch, you don't have many floral resources. You have weeds. You're going to have weeds growing down through that, that mulch. Nesting sites become limited because bees can't, the, the ground nesters can't, can't go down through the mulch or the landscape fabric. Yeah. So, and it's also a cost saver. Um, I talked to a group that said they had spent $15,000 for their homeowners association on mulch last year. And I'm thinking, but they were wondering how they could get more flowers. And I said, well, you know, take that $15,000 and maybe, maybe move it over. So yeah, uh, those two things are kind of a negative when we're talking about, about pollinators. This is actually the front of my house. Um, so landscape plugs are a really cost-effective way to do this if you're landscaping. They can be a dollar a piece. There are native plant wholesalers that are growing these guys. They're struggling to keep up because there's a demand. So anybody looking for a niche market um, maybe might be a place to go. These plugs can also be purchased and potted up into quartz and sold at garden centers. So there is a source for these plants. Um, there are also seed sources out there. A lot of people are collecting local epitypes. And also when you're placing these, diversity is really key. I told you that plants, uh, pollinators and their plants are closely related. 
Look at this penstemon. I mean, this penstemon isn't letting anything to chance. Here's a landing pad for the bumblebee. Guidelines. Hey, guys, that's the way to go, right? Um, and each of these plants is going to attract a different kind of pollinator because they all have different sized tongues and um, different needs. So diversity is great. Planning, we're trying to get people to plant in groups and drifts because one single plant isn't going to help a pollinator too much. And you know, they'll see a mass much better and have plants to move between. Succession of bloom. Plants from spring through fall. There are different kinds of bees emerging in March and the whole way through the season until the first really hard frost. They all need food. So picking a succession of bloom, it also means, hey, we're getting more plants out there. We're selling more plants. Um, we're, we're enjoying more plants. We're seeing more color in the landscape. So here are the results of the 84 species that we did. You have the full results on your on your papers, I'm only going to touch on a few of these plants for the sake of time. In general, we discovered that plants with large compound inflorescences of tiny flowers attracted more different kinds of pollinators than other flowers. This is where we got our diversity. So think swamp milkweed over here on the left, um, bone set in the middle, which is one of the eupatoriums the joe pies. There are many, many flowers out there that have these kind of flower heads. They're not the only thing you should plant, but you know, if you're trying to, to get a plant to a, a new gardener, to biggest bang for their buck, these are the way to go. And then I'm going to start with our number one winner right off the top. Pycnanthema muticum, uh, the clustered mountain man. Is anybody growing this? You are? Okay. No. Lots of pollinators? Yeah. yeah. Apple mint. Apple mint. Okay. The mint family in general, um, the mint family, the aster family, um, are both huge families for pollinators. And this is a native mint, but yes, other mints you know, will, will do well too if you let them flower. And this clustered mountain mint was, was a plant that we felt could be a gorgeous plant for the garden, um, as well as valuable for pollinators. Smells wonderful. We had 21 different kinds of pollinators visit it, from butterflies to flies to beetles to, to bees to wasps. Um, it seemed as though if you, you could tell where it was in the child plot because there was this bzzz over the top of it. And I actually had one educator come visit our plot. And we, we talked about the plot before we went in. He told me later, if you hadn't told me that that was a good thing, I would have made a big birth around that plant. He said, because there was so much stuff on it. But, but he said, now I know. It's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So we need some education, too. Um, it only grows about three to four feet tall, does like some soil moisture. It's not, not a plant for real dry soils. It had an advantage over the other plants because it bloomed for 10 weeks. And so, you know, we were counting pollinators for a lot longer. And one of the best uses I've seen for this plant was at Irvine Nature Center. This is a parking lot divider. And the only downside to having that was when people were getting in their cars with their purchases, they, no, they would, get, they would get their cameras out and they'd be taking pictures of buckeyes and all kinds of, it would take them 20 minutes to get out of the parking lot. And I have to say, in the three years, well, five years now, that master gardeners, about 20 of them, have been working in this trial plot, there's been not a single sting. These guys are too busy. Only the females can sting of the wasps and the bees because it's the ovipositor that's the stinger. The males can't sting. Guess who has time on their hands? The males. The females are doing all the work. They've, they've got to get the nectar. They have a short period of time. They've got to get the pollen. They've got to feed the kids. They could care less about you. The males are kind of hanging around and being a little aggressive, um, but they can't hurt you. Okay. Golden rods. I would like to, I'm okay on time. Five minutes, okay. 
I would love to see anybody here growing goldenrods? Yes, not wild. <laughs> Goldenrods are an extremely important plant. It really tied for number one with that mountain mint. This is, this is stiff goldenrod. Butterflies loved it. We're doing a project with the Xerces Society right now to find out what nectar plants the monarch is using on its trek from Canada to Mexico. And they're strongly suspecting that goldenrod has historically always been one of the fuels to help them get down to their wintering grounds. Um, so they're extremely important. And we had so many butterflies on this plant. It really stands up very tall. and It will withstand some, some medium to dry soils. It's blooming as we speak um, and just attracts so many different pollinators. Would be great for back of the border. It does seed around. After five years, we're learning which plants stayed in place and which ones didn't. Um, and in some places, seeding around would be great. In the case of, of a homeowner, they might not like it so much. So, hey, got another goldenrod for you, fireworks. This one just kind of grows out from a center patch and forms a larger patch. Easy to take care of, you divide it, and you can keep it in check. It, all the goldenrods were very good for pollinators. And I would love to dispel the fact that people think that goldenrod is, is an allergen. I hear that all the time. It's insect pollinated, pollen's heavy. It does not get carried by wind. Insects move it. It is not an allergen. Ragweed is the, is the, the culprit. And when I went to England last fall, I saw more goldenrod in garden notes over there than I ever see here. They have a love affair with it. They shouldn't because it's become invasive for them. Um, because they don't, have, you know, they don't have the ecosystem built around it. But this is Shakespeare's birthplace. I mean, uh, just amazing use of goldenrod. They love it. They're selling it back to us, by the way. Okay. And here's Thera Wart, another wonderful, wonderful pollinator plant attracted a lot of those, those uh, parasitoids of the brown marmorated stink bug. Very easy to grow plant, likes, likes dry soil and full sun. None of these native plants ever need fertilizer, ever. In fact, fertilizer is counterproductive to them. They are adapted for nutrient-poor soils. The Joe Pie, I can't say enough about these. And they, all of them were wonderful plants. Even all the cultivars, all the straight species did very, very well. I singled out Dubium because it was our number one plant for attracting butterflies. We, over three years, we had 17 different butterflies and skippers on it. It was the last one to bloom. It's actually a, it is actually a plant of the coastal plain. Uh, it's the shortest, shortest of all the Joe Pies, which is always popular with homeowners. Um, like all the Joe Pies, average to moist soil. And it is just beginning to bloom now. Okay. Swamp milkweed. If you have a garden center, milkweeds are so popular. At our plant sales, um, at our office, we, we can hardly get them. The growers are having trouble keeping them in stock because everybody knows about the monarch. And everybody wants to help. Even common milkweed is flying off the shelves. Um, the swamp milkweed is a great plant for all kinds of pollinators, including a good nectar plant for the monarch. And they love to lay their eggs on this plant. Um, so it, but it does need moist soil. Um, there are other milkweeds that can be grown that need other, other conditions. There's a milkweed for everybody. Rattlesnake master, pretty cool plant. Um, this is, in it. is anybody growing this one? I know this one. This was a bit of a surprise to us. I was a little surprised to see how good it was as a pollinator plant, but all those tiny little flowers um, were attracting a lot of different uh, diversity. And it's a very cool plant. The kids love it. And I was interested to see that at the new formal garden by the mansion at Mount Cuba Center, they have incorporated Rattlesnake Master into their garden as a structural element. So it's really very cool. Okay. And then a few comparisons. Do we have time for this? Or do we? Sure. Okay. 
Um, there are a lot of comparisons, and you have the cultivar sheet there for, for all of them. Here are just a few examples. We looked at the straight species of Monarda fustulosa against Claire Grace. And what we discovered is that the straight species was very much preferred. Don't know what it is about Claire Grace that the butterflies or the, the bees didn't, um, didn't prefer it, but and maybe it was just, just the fact that we had so much food available. Okay. But this, this is, you'll see on your sheets, is a terrific plant for pollinators. Six different kinds of bumblebees on here, hummingbird moths. And you plant it with other plants so that if it does get powdery mildew, you don't notice it. You put it with its friends. Here's another cultivar comparison uh, between the aromatic asters, three different kinds. And in this case, you'll see that the cultivar October Skies was preferred. We were, we were surprised to see that. Um, but it, it actually did better. And it's a shorter variety. Um, than the straight species, and did not seem to seed around very much, um, which was kind of a plus too. And then we looked at Coreopsis, um, three different types of Coreopsis, including the straight species. And after three years, Zagreb had done better, possibly because it, was, it was, had, had more flowers on it than the straight species. Um, but what was interesting, we're five years into this, we're not counting pollinators on these plants any longer, but the plants are still in the, in the trial. And after five years, Zagreb is starting to fade under the weed pressure at the farm. Because we can, you know, I only have 20 master gardeners and trying to get all these weeds out of there is interesting. So we've kind of left moonbeam go. It, it just isn't, it's still there, but it doesn't have the vigor. Zagreb is fading a little bit, but the straight species, we don't have to do much to. So it's, it's just interesting watching what happens over time with these plants. And I wanted to give a shout out to this particular plant, um, the Menarda Peters Fancy Fuchsia. We're not 100% sure of the parentage of this plant. If somebody knows, I, I'd like to know what it is. Um, but in our trials, it was a favorite of bumblebees. And they would hang on to it to the very last, you know, last flower, till it just about was ready to fall off. And in our trials has really held up under all this weed pressure, so I just feel it's a really good garden plant. The other thing that came out of this trial is a phenology chart. We kept track of the bloom for a couple of years. Um, this is not in your handout or on the website, but if you want it, I can send it to you. It's, you know, it prints large because it's 84 different species but it's a really handy thing to have if you want to think about planting that succession of bloom and there were really i mean all the plot all the plants in our plot did pretty well if you want to see the full report you can go to the center for pollinator research website just google it go to the pollinator garden certification this is a master gardener program and under step one provide food for pollinators there will be a link to bees, bugs, and blooms. And I have a card up here with the website on it if, if you're interested. Okay. So hopefully together, I mean, what, it's, this is a feel-good thing because getting plants out there and, and getting plants in the hands of people and kids is great. Wow, helping pollinators at the same time is even better. So, you know, collectively, I think we can make a real difference. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.